Welcome back everyone. Today we've got something uh, I'm particularly excited to look at. This is a Microtik RB5009, uh, which is their latest in the router board series small office home office routers. And the 5009 departs from previous models, the 2011, 3011, 4011, in being a whole lot smaller as well as being actually substantially more featured. Um, this is a 5009 UPR plus S plus IN. Uh, and what that means is that this is a 5009 with PoE out on, I want to say, eight of the nine ports. Um, and if you're not familiar with their designation, the major number, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, indicates the generation. And in this case, the nine is the number of ports. So we've got a few less ports. Overall, it's a little smaller, uh, but that's not a bad thing and we're gonna see why. So let's go ahead and get this one open. And this is going to be deployed. All right, so I'm not gonna show you guys, but the passwords are now on a sticker. We get a quick start guide, piece of foam. Uh, as I was saying, this is gonna be deployed at a client site in conjunction with a CAP AX, which is where some of these features are really going to jump out. So on the front, we've got one SFP plus port rated for 10 gig, one 2.5 gig port, and then seven gigabit PoE ports, and we have PoE out on the 2.5 gig. That's huge. That means that I'm going to be able to use that 2.5 gig to drive a 2.5 gig link to a CAP AX, which is a wireless access point. Also on the front, we have our DC 24 to 57 volt input. On the side, we have a secondary DC input and the non-POE version of this, uh, oh yeah, this, this'll take POE in on any of the ports as well. So I've got three different options for powering it. We can see that this is a solid aluminum heat sink bolted to the bottom. The top portion of the chassis is plastic. The reason for that design is that you can actually put four of these in a single rack unit. Also included is a power adapter and this is rated for output DC 48 volts, two amps, which is 96 watts. Uh, and I don't think that's the maximum that this can provide at PoE out. I think you can get a bigger power supply for like 160 watts theoretically. Um, however, that's not a bad capacity to ship with either. And a couple of screws. Unfortunately, it didn't come with a rack mount kit, which is a bummer. Uh, man. We also get a USB port on the front. That's actually a big selling feature for me. I have a 2004, which is from the uh, small bit, medium business and enterprise side at home uh, that was left over from a deployment that got switched out. And... It doesn't have a USB port, which means although I can run the loud, latest router OS 7 stack on it, what I can't do is run a local Docker container for something like Pi-hole. I have to run that in a separate VM on my Hyper-V host at home, uh, which isn't the end of the world, but it would be nice to stick it on the firewall. And I can do that with this model. I can't do that with um, the bottom tier of the enterprise models. That's a new feature in router OS 7 is that the 64-bit ARM options, which is what this is, are capable of running Docker. Uh, on the pricing side, this unit was about 260 bucks. You'll notice there's no Wi-Fi. If you're looking at an AX level access point, that is another $100, $130, depending on the uh, exact model if you're staying inside Microtix ecosystem, uh, which this particular client is. So this is going to be paired with a CAP AX. I might do a separate unboxing on that. I might not, depends on if I can take the screws out of it. 
Uh, we're going to break for a second. I'm going to grab the detail camera and we're going to open this up. All right, now that we're on the detail camera, a uh, couple of things. This is where they would normally uh, put the admin password. I've gone ahead and covered that. Uh, on the CPU side, we've got a 64-bit ARM 88F7040, which is between 350 and 1400 megahertz. Not a bad chip. Uh, equipped with one gig of RAM and one gig of NAND flash, also not bad for something like this. I'm a little surprised to see that it only ships with router OS level 5. That's a decent router OS level. Uh, however, this is a device that I previously would have expected to see a level 6 license on. Level 5 gets you access to most things you want, and I feel like you'd probably be well enough off with this with a level five license. Uh, it's not like you're gonna use one of these to handle more than 500 L2TP VPN tunnels typically. But the reason I'm surprised is that the HAP AX3, which is a wireless access point, well, it's a small office, home office, converged access point device. I'm using them as access points, I should say. It has a level six license, which is just unlimited across the board. And I feel like maybe that decision was made to prevent this from cannibalizing sales of some of the 2000 series devices that are just a smidge um, higher end and more profitable than this. Like I said, I don't think anyone's gonna be hurt by this shipping with level five. I was just surprised to see it. I don't think I missed any screws. This is just pretty tight. Lots of thermal pads. Okay, and that actually looked like thermal paste. So this is our heat sink, some identifiers. There's a thermal pad that squeegeed over a little bit. And our RB5009 motherboard. And there is our switch chip, there is our CPU, here's our RAM and our NAND package. And can I see the other side of the board without fighting too much? And what I expect to see on the other side is mostly the passives for Ethernet and Probably a little bit of the uh, PoE. Oh, there we go. Oop. Another copy of the admin password, if you ever lose it, is stuck inside. I'm just going to stick that to the top of the case. And here we can see all of our magnetics for Ethernet, the NAND package. It looks like there was at some point a plan to put an M.2 device here. That would have been very likely for a Wi-Fi chip. Um, it wasn't uncommon to see router board devices like this ship with both a wired and wireless version. Uh, the 2011 did it, the 3011 didn't, the 4011 did. Uh, the 5009, I would love to see a wireless version of it, but I don't think that's going to happen at this point in the product's life cycle. I think the HAP AX3 is capable enough that I'm never going to see a 5009 with Wi-Fi, which is a bummer. Um, I'm guessing maybe that would have been for an SD card slot in the back as well that they considered. I could be wrong. Um, just looking at the, the contact pad, these are clearly keyed like you would expect for M.2. This is just a row of pins across. It's too many for an SD card. Um, maybe it was another storage device. I don't see a label on it. It just says J505. Um, but hey, okay, that actually says 
M.2 PCIe SSD drive. So their 100% was a plan to add an M.2 slot to this. And hopefully, I mean, I'd love to see this with an M.2 SSD variant, um, especially for the option of running containers as opposed to using a USB attached SSD. Um, do, do, do. And that says PCIe USB. That typically would have been for a WAN module um, or a Wi Fi chip. I don't see any antenna mounts, which is a bit surprising. Although you can see, especially in the PoE version of this, uh, this board is fully packed as far as handling power distribution is concerned. Um, looking at the top shell, I can see where it looks like there may have been plans for a cutout for an SSD access hatch, um, but it looks like it never made it into production. I'm getting thermal paste on my stuff. There's more power stuff there. I already mentioned that was the NAND. Um, I'm guessing this chip's probably the USB controller, just based on where those traces seem to go. I could be wrong. Um, no, I don't think that is. I think that's related to the uh, Magnetics probably for the 2.5 gig port itself following that again and Then we've got our SFP plus I Do like how much is labeled on the board all the ports are labeled on this side the USB 3 is labeled um, the What do they call this HDR is the power connector there. There's actually a second pin pad set for another one of these connectors. I don't know if that's because it has to move based on the PoE versus non-PoE version of it, or if they were contemplating using two of them. Um, really wish I, I had an answer for that. But anyway, that's the internals on the 5009. This heat sink is massive. You can see that. Fully passive, that's probably why we see some of the speed numbers that we do. I'm a little surprised to see with the machining that they did that this is a shim. So they have the two packages, the switch chip and the CPU. And there's a shim that connects them to the actual heat spreader, as opposed to either putting a taller heat spreader on the packages themselves or machining this out. So that was clearly a cost saving measure and this is extruded as a single piece and then just notched where the fins are. Uh, Nothing wrong with that design, especially for ARM chips like these. Just a little surprising. All right, so with all of that, um, that's a quick tour of what's in a 5009 and some of the options that Microtik did and didn't take in building it. I would absolutely love to get the M2 PCIe slot in it. In fact, if they released this with or without PoE, um, and reintroduced the M2 PCIe SSD, I'd probably replace my 2004. Uh, I think that's uh, a shame that it doesn't have that. The level five versus level six license thing is mostly academic. It's just a quad core ARM chip with like a, what did I say, 1600 megahertz uh, top speed? No, 1400 megahertz top speed. And with a gig of RAM, you're probably gonna run out of memory and CPU time before you hit any of the feature limits that level five limits you to. Uh, you get 
everything. You get BGP routing, you get all the VPN features, you get all of the management stuff, you can run Capsman on it. There's nothing you can't do. You just run into some limitations where your VPN tunnel count, in fact, I've got it open here. You know, you're limited to 500 L2TP tunnels, 500 PPTP, 500 PPPOE tunnels. You know, those aren't something that you're going to run out of. Um, and I've never actually used the user management active, user manager active sessions feature or the uh, hotspot active users. But you've got unlimited open VPN, unlimited EIOP, unlimited VLANs, unlimited queues, unlimited bonding interfaces. Uh, it ships unlocked enough that I don't think the hardware here is uh, going to be underutilized. And that's Microtech's big thing. I mean, this is a $300 device that doesn't come with any training wheels. Um, I think I said I paid 260 for this one, which is the current market rate, give or take. The MSRP is 299 Overall, it's not a bad device, especially when you look at, I've seen routers from, you know, Asus that are just AX devices that are four, five hundred, six hundred dollars $600, where they don't have PoE, their 10 gig interface is just one. This actually has 10 gig plus two and a half. And uh, yeah, they're prettier. I will not even argue that. They are prettier to look at and maybe a little easier to manage for someone who doesn't want to get their hands dirty. Uh, if you don't mind getting your hands dirty, if you don't mind mucking around in router OS, uh, these offer an excellent value for small businesses and home users alike. And now that I know how to do that correctly, that went a whole lot easier than the removal. And I just need to get that to slide in like that. And then this will screw back in there. Uh, I do wish I had ordered it with the rack kit. Uh, I'm probably going to go ahead and order that afterwards and just have it sit on top of the switch it's being deployed with. Uh, I'm not going to do an unboxing of that. It's just a CSS 326. It's a 24 port switch with two 10 gig ports. There's nothing exciting in it. It's not even a router OS device, so there's no CPU or anything like that to get a look at. It is literally just a dumb switch. Well, it's a smart switch. It's a CSS, but uh, it's not coming with any exciting or interesting features. Um, the AX3, I've had mixed results getting wireless access points open, and although I want to see how it's built, if it's just pop, uh, popped together with plastic tags, plastic tabs, I'm going to skip that. Uh, with all that said, while I close this back up, I'd like to thank Electrix for our opening and closing themes. I'd like to thank anyone who helps support Pocketables in whatever manner you choose. It's support like that that helps make videos like this possible. And I'd like to remind everyone that there's a Discord link in the description. If you'd like to join us there and have a little more influence on what videos we do and don't make. Lastly, thank you for watching.